So, we were discussing a different types of exposure systems, right? We have seen the contact printing, proximity printing and projection printing. Um, and you can, you can probably see the uh, meaning of this, right? So, the name uh, is quite meaningful uh, in all these cases. Now, uh, if you look uh, in these two cases, okay? So, you want to expose a mass, uh, meaning a wafer, okay? And your mask would be actually of the size of the wafer, right? typically, yeah, in same order of uh, the size as uh, of the uh, wafer. This case also, uh, though not necessarily, but uh, you, you, the gap is usually very small, so it's not possible to or not preferable to move this around. Okay, but in this case, you can see that. Uh, there is nothing uh, in close proximity to the wafer, okay? Uh, there is nothing in contact with the wafer, yeah, from the lithography system. So, of course, this will be mounted on something which holds the wafer tight, okay? But not from the optical uh, system or mask, nothing is in contact with this. So, it is not necessary for you to actually have, it is possible for us to, okay, I have a small mask, meaning uh, with features maybe four times that of the uh, feature you really want on the wafer, right? And then uh, I would reduce it, yeah? But one thing you can actually uh, see is that this uh, mask is made using electron beam lithography and we will also see some advanced techniques when you actually reduce the dimensions of the features you want. Uh, on the wafer, right? Uh, so, it is quite expensive. The mask is for advanced lithography uh, uh, systems, the mask is quite expensive, okay? And also, you, have, you might have seen this wafer size actually has, now people started with 2 inch wafers, now you are talking about 300 is the industry standard. Um, but some people are now talking about 450 millimeter. Eh? So, I am uh, talking about uh, 2 inch. Uh, so, the point, so what I, I was talking about is that in a projection printing system, this is not in contact with anything, okay? So, there is no compulsion for you to actually make the mask or the uh, mask as big as the wafer, okay? On the other hand, the wafer sizes had been increasing, okay? So, you are talking about, um, you know, people started with very small wafers, like maybe 1 inch, I don't know, but 2 inch wafers you can still buy uh, for university applications, right? Uh, and then 3 inch, 4 inch, 6 inch uh, and uh, 8 inch, okay? And then came 12 inch, so you can... Uh, uh, convert this, of course, to the millimeters, right? We have uh, 50 millimeter, 100 millimeter, 150 millimeter, 200, came 300. Now, people are talking about 450, yeah? So, there are uh, some uh, places where 450 millimeter uh, wafers are being tried for uh, processing. Okay, so of the advantage is obvious that I can make uh, uh, meaning. So, if you are increasing the area by, you are increasing the diameter by a factor of 1.5, area by 2.25, okay. So, you are increasing the area by more than 200 percentage, yeah. Uh, so, you have a uh, or two more than uh, 200 percentage. So, this means that with the same kind of, I am doing a oxidation for example, instead of uh, making 100 or 1000 chips, I am now making 2250 chips, okay. okay. So, that is the idea. So, you basically, you are able to uh, increase your throughput in manufacturing if I have everything else remain the same. But here, it is a little bit of a different story because I need to now make a mask which is larger, 
and then as the feature sizes come down uh, this becomes quite expensive okay. So what is being done here is actually you make a mask which is small so maybe would contain uh, four dies or four chips okay. May I am just giving you some number okay. Uh, so of course here you may actually be able to print uh, let's say 500 uh, chips right. So what you would do is step and repeat. So what is it called? You have this wafer and you have the projection system and then keep the wafer like this. You print four dies okay and then switch off the light and step. The wafer is stepped okay. So then the next four dies are printed okay. So this is called a step and repeat system okay. So you have this right. I would actually do some raster scan kind of stuff. So I have four dies and then the next one is exposed by moving the wafer uh, okay. So this is a very important uh, thing it is called a step and repeat system. So many a time uh, projection lithography printers are called steppers okay um, and now other thing is so this mass that we talked about say, uh, the, the mass that contains small number of dice on them are called reticle yeah? so if I have this would be called a reticle okay so you are designing not the meaning mask with the uh, which has dimensions uh, same or slightly bigger than the wafer you are making mask that is small and then you use a step and repeat process okay. Now when I do this so we talked about alignment okay so we need to get very small overlay errors right. So the alignment we should actually like it to be perfect okay. So in this case you have a whole wafer yeah uh, and then I need to align it only once okay. So you will have on the big mask somewhere this alignment marks you have seen uh, these crosses in the previous uh, uh, one of the previous slides right. Uh, so you would have this alignment marks on different places on the mask and hence on the wafer okay. This alignment marks are repeated uh, from uh, on every mask okay. So this is then called a global alignment you are actually aligning all the dies to let us say four uh, alignment marks at the corners of the wafer just as an example. <coughs> but in this case you are actually doing what is called step and repeat every time you step it you have to realign it. So then it is called a local alignment <coughs> okay and since the alignment marks take space right and there can be some errors because of uh, the reticle deformation and other things uh, and uh, temperature effects become important when you are going to few nanometers of feature sizes right. Uh, so what people do is you do not actually use dedicated alignment marks you actually use the features that are part of your devices for alignment okay. So if I have for example so there there is already let us say I am making a MOSFET right. So this is my gate okay this is a gate. So instead of aligning it to something on the reticle which is like a cross right, I just do the alignment to the gate feature. So there is a cross section in the top view so of course you have right yeah okay.
So the the uh, uh, the local alignment actually provide you better alignment accuracy because you are not uh, you know if you have big wafer and uh, difference in thermal expansion coefficient already can give you a few nanometers of the uh, shift in the okay in the features so it is always uh, better in advanced lithography which, uh, where you are targeting few tens of nanometers to be uh, something uh, done using lo uh, local alignment okay so now if you look at this uh, projection system so you have a light source right and the light comes in and then uh, you have some lens and so on, so okay, so that is fine. And this is your mask, yeah. So these regions are opaque, and then this part is transparent, okay. Everything is a little bit exaggerated here. You might have seen on the previous slide, uh, if you go back, that uh, this is something called a collimating lens. So it's actually supposed to produce a parallel beam of light. Okay, but uh, meaning let's say that that's not very important. So you have, or we we are trying to generalize uh, this case. So you have a source, and then you have a mask which is opaque except uh, in this small aperture. Okay, so this is your wafer. That's where you want the image of the aperture to be produced. Okay, so we have basically removed the lenses from this discussion. Now, if I look at this, I want an image of this to be produced on the plane. Okay, so I can do, uh, you know, if this feature is large, yeah, then it is possible for me to draw the rays that are emanating from the source and then do what is called ray optics. Okay, and of course we need to worry about uh, this thing. So suppose this is glass, I need to worry about the refractor index and so on and so forth. But I can play with ray optics and find out what would be the image, how it is formed and things like that. But in advanced lithography systems, you are talking about feature sizes which are very close to or actually even you are targeting feature sizes smaller than the wavelength of light. Okay. So you have seen this 193 nanometer uh, lithography, uh, immersion lithography is used for printing uh, feature sizes or actually not printing but eventual feature size of the gate on the wafer can be 20 nanometers. Uh, you are starting with a 193 nanometer light. So the final feature size is much smaller than uh, the wavelength of light. Okay. So this means I can't now work with ray optics. I need to actually uh, look at uh, the light as a wave, okay? And then I need to actually then do an analysis and look at what kind of effects are important uh, when the aperture sizes are in the same uh, order or uh, as as your uh, uh, wavelength of light. So you can actually look at this as small wavelets, yeah, uh, propagating along the uh, uh, length of the system, and then it comes here, right? And this is your aperture, and you have this wavelets passing through, and they get diffracted on the way, okay? Yeah, and they may actually go through interference on the feature, meaning on the image plane that you are interested in, okay? So this is a very important uh, aspect. Now if you look at uh, this uh, system, now uh, we come back to our photolithography system, we have a collimating lens, it makes, supposed to make a parallel beam of light. Uh, so you are supposed to get, you know, if I actually apply ray optics, I should just get a beam of light here, okay? Suppose I don't have this lens, right? 
So I'll get a beam that would come like this. But because these features are in the same order of the uh, wavelength of light, the diffraction will be significant. Okay? So that is a very important thing. Now, as a consequence of diffraction, you can see whatever light that is going through would diverge, right? Get diffracted. And unless you have a very large lens, you will not be able to capture all the light. Okay? So this is really, this light is required for you to make a clear image of the uh, beam, uh, meaning the, the aperture. So that is uh, one of the difficulties in the whole system. Now, if you look at this, so you have this light diffracting out and then you have a focusing lens that focuses this onto the image plane to uh, recreate an image, uh, you know, uh, meaning you are trying to replicate uh, or create an image of the aperture on the uh, uh, image plane. So, we will not go into the details now actually because of the interference effects uh, of this different small wavelets that are coming in, okay, you get uh, uh, the intensity of light uh, shown like this. So, this is, what is this function? Yeah, sync function, right? So, it shows this, kind of, it, it does not go to 0, okay. Uh, of course, you, meaning, uh, uh, so you have a, a local uh, zeros here, but not uh, throughout. So, the intensity will ripple and then become very weak. Okay. So, you can uh, see this real, uh, if I take this spot, meaning this area, and then I can see if the aperture is circular, I have a central dot, but there are rings around it. Okay. So, this is a very important uh, consideration and this would be uh, uh, at 1.22 lambda fd, so f is actually the focal length of the lens and d is the diameter of this focusing lens, okay. Lambda is the wavelength of light, right. So, that is, and so from this point, this would be 1.22 lambda f by b, okay. So, that is the first zero. Now, based on this, you can define what is the resolution of a lithography system by considering this. Suppose I have two point sources, okay. See, when we discussed the critical dimension, we talked about two parallel lines, right? What is the spacing between them, okay? Uh, so, you can uh, see that if I actually uh, want to define the resolution, uh, you have these two lines, how close you can actually bring them, okay, but still be able to distinguish them. When the image is formed, you should be able to distinguish these two images, okay. So, that is the basic criteria. So, if you take point sources, there are small circular dots, okay, uh, because we have a very clear, uh, you know, the, the ring and then the interference fringes around it, right. Um, so, we will just extend that. So, you have these points A and B and then they will form on the image plane images A dash and B dash, okay. So, we should be able to distinguish these two uh, dots on the image plane, okay. So, I am going to bring this closer, right. I am going to bring this closer. So, they will also become closer, but at some point I will not be able to distinguish them from each other, okay, or it becomes very difficult, okay.
So we have this from So this is your A, right? So I am going to bring the B, so B is let us say here, right? Similar identical features. Something like this, right? Okay. So this is B, and I'm going to bring them closer. Okay. So what would happen? Okay. So actually, I, I can see this, right? I would let's see if I bring it here. Okay, I bring it closer, then I may have the peak, for example, here, right here. Okay, so instead of, now I have brought them so close, instead of, so if I actually look at the total intensity of light, that would look like this, right? Huh? Two intensities are adding up. So I may still be able to resolve them. Yeah? So this is a very important uh, aspect. So this is essentially giving you the limit of uh, the resolution. Okay. So this is called the Rayleigh limit when this the, uh, the peak of the peak intensity of the next dot B is at the first minimum of the for uh, uh, A, okay. This is called the Rayleigh limit of uh, resolution. So you can then write this equation. This is actually then defined as the limit of resolution, okay. And uh, this is 1.22 lambda f by d, okay, that we have seen from the previous slide. And you are basically uh, trying to write d, okay. The diameter of the lens in terms of the uh, focal length and the refractive index and alpha is actually the collection angle. Yeah? So this is basically the collection angle of the lens, so half of this. Okay. So you can reduce this into 0.61 by lambda, uh, lambda by n sine alpha. Uh, and this is called n sine alpha is called the numerical aperture of the uh, uh, lens. Okay. So this is the refractive index of what? Refractive index of what? Pardon? The material with which you make the lens. Okay. And alpha is this angle. Okay. Uh, half of that angle that over which you collect the uh, light. Okay. <coughs> so this is uh, we had uh, looked at the uh, uh, essentially we have we had looked at a, a circular feature, right? In general, the features that you are going to print on a VLSI would be more rectangular, yeah, hardly any circular features. Of course, there will be circular features, uh, for example, for making contacts, uh, you make circular features, but for gate, active area and so on, usually have um, rectangular features. Okay. So to generalize this, so you have this K1 instead of 0.61 okay, and uh, lambda by Na. So this is uh, telling you about the features on your mask, right? The geometrical aspects of it, and then Na would be actually the 
properties of the lens optical system okay so the value of uh, k1 is usually in the range of 0 0.6 to 0 0.8 okay so you have circular features to rectangular uh, features now uh, i mentioned about immersion lithography and instead of so this is the whole thing is what the whole thing is hmm? air suppose i make this water huh? so i actually put my wafer water and then comes the lens so what would happen to the system Yeah, so the refractor index here would change. And what has this? What is the effect of that on the on this F? Hmm? Pardon? Refractor index index increases. So what would happen? Pardon? So if I have this is this air, right? Then that comes here and it actually bends in, right? Okay. But suppose I actually have it going from here and then I go this. Okay. So you are talking about going from a denser medium into Okay, so that is what is happening here, right? You have it going from glass to air, but instead of that, I am using going to use hmm? yeah. So I can actually have it just going something like this. So what would be the consequence of it? So the focal length, what happens to focal length? If I have something, right? What happens to focal length? Focal length should decrease or increase? Hmm? Focal length will? So let us uh, take this, right? You just work it out. Tell me what would happen. Okay, so what I want is that light is coming in, right? The light comes in, right? I take this. Light comes in and it will bend which way? Then like this, right? What you are saying is that it would bend less. Okay, so now here. The focal length will increase. Okay, so this part would actually increase. Yeah, so your numerical aperture is going to. Huh? So your f is going to increase, n a would increase. Yeah, because this whole thing is the n a. Okay, so which means that your resolution is going to improve. What do you want? Is that resolution is smaller? It is the the resolution is better. So R is going to decrease. Okay, so you have better resolution. Yeah. So that is why you want to use uh, medium other than air. So using the same. So what it actually allows you is that I would be able to design a system with a higher numerical aperture. Okay. A lens can be designed with a higher numerical aperture. Okay, so that is why uh, uh, you know you I mentioned about this immersion lithography, and uh, the immersion lithography uh, has its own problems because you have to put a wafer with photoresist and water, okay, uh, and uh, the lens 
this, this uh, thing has to be in water and so on and so forth, okay. So the water has to be extremely clean and uh, the resist should not be, you know, no defects in the resist and so on and so forth. So this had taken a lot of time for people to develop the right kind of resist. So if I actually take the resist and put it in water, it should not absorb the water and swell, yeah, all kind of problems should be resolved, okay. So the another thing is actually in lithography is it is something meaning you know it from the uh, uh, photography if you have noticed is what is called depth of focus, depth of focus, okay. Now we do not see usually yeah it is depth of focus is not so evident in uh, in your mobile phone uh, camera images yeah because uh, you cannot you know, why, why is it so? so your depth of focus is No, actually the the uh, the uh, what is it called? There is something called F number. Okay, this is which is um, the one of the properties of the lens that is used in photography. Okay, so that cannot be. You they, they you you need this. So if you go and buy a lens, right? Uh, so they actually say this. What is it? I don't remember. It is one by F or F. Anybody can help me with that? So this is essentially the aperture of the lens, okay. So now the idea is very clear, you go to, next time you go to the lake, okay. And you are looking at something, you can't see it very clearly. What do you do? <laughs> yes, he is trying to squint, right, meaning you are trying Right? You can't see something very clearly. So what are you trying to do? Actually? Okay. Or you can actually hold a finger. This is something also, right? You have a small hole. You are trying to reduce the the opening here. So you can actually see for long distances. Okay. So the same. So now, but the thing is that if I actually have very small aperture, I have a great depth of field, okay. But then in again in photography which you do not care about these days in uh, using a mobile phone, it is point and shoot, right. Uh, but if I am using a very small aperture, the amount of light that comes through is very small, okay. So if I, uh, then I need to expose, yeah. Because uh, I have a sensor which has some fixed sensitivity, okay. So I need to now get lot more light means I have to expose for longer time, okay. So a smaller aperture and then you expose it for longer time. This is usually the trick in photography. You have a smaller exposure meaning the aperture and then uh, you need to expose it for longer time to get sufficient light to form a good image, okay. But then if I make a larger aperture, okay, then what is happening is that you can't, you know, this is from your own experience, you can see that uh, your depth of focus is actually much smaller, okay. But then you can actually make an image much faster because a lot of light is coming in. Okay, so depth of focus is this that you are focusing somewhere here and uh, meaning you, you, you have used here uh, a camera uh, with a lens that has uh, very large aperture, okay. So you can get this image. So you might have seen this uh, uh, photographs of people, you know, meaning uh, political leaders, right, they, they are walking around or you may actually see this uh, film stars. And there are a lot of people, but only this guy's face is clear. That's a trick in, meaning this is, you are using uh, a taking advantage of what is called a depth of focus. You can see this line. Now why this is important for uh, VLSI technology? Okay. So if you look at this image, 
Okay, this is silicon and you have some isolation and you put something on top, which is this polysilicon for making the gate. Okay, so I need to now focus um, something that I want to uh, pattern on the uh, uh, top of this wafer, but there is already a topography on the wafer, okay, uh, because of whatever you have done prior to this uh, step. So I want to have a feature here as well as here. Now what is my problem? I need clear images here as well as here, okay, but there is a difference, uh, step, there is a step, so I can't get a clear image. If I actually have a, a, a clear focus here, I will not be able to focus here, Prob unless I have a large depth of focus. So that is the idea. So uh, you can see that uh, you know we had been talking about reducing the wavelength to get better resolution that you have seen from your previous slide, right? Uh, so the R is proportional to lambda. But then I have a problem. Uh, so this is uh, some optics. What you can see here is these are the equations for depth of focus is uh, delta here. So this is essentially you have an image plane, right? Okay, and the light is coming from this place, yeah. And you shift the image plane by a certain distance. Okay, so you take it from here and uh, go to this place. So you can actually see a delta is defined by how much you can shift, but then that delta is equal to lambda by 4, okay. So this is called the limit of focus. This is an kind of uh, the path length difference between uh, 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 the rays that are coming in, okay. Uh, so this distance and this, okay. So you have a difference in the path length. Okay, and that should be uh, close to lambda by 4. So that is the basic idea in this. So that is defined as depth of focus. There are other definitions of depth of focus as well. So this is, uh, uh, you can write this lambda by 4 as delta minus delta cos theta. Okay, so this is a trigonometry, simple thing, right? You then expand cos theta uh, into series. And then you substitute for Na from previous. So Na was actually N sin theta, okay. So if you take N is 1 because it is air, okay, uh, then uh, this is nothing but sin theta and then you get depth of focus. So important thing here is to see that if you decrease the lambda, okay, you decrease the lambda, you are going to decrease the depth of focus. Okay, so this is a very important aspect because you want to reduce the wavelength of light to get smaller features and then depth of focus is going to decrease. Okay, so as a consequence I can't have large topographies on my wafer. Wafer surface should be then flat, uh, more flat, okay. So this is a very important aspect and then you can uh, see that uh, there is this uh, process called Damascene. I already talked to you about Damascene process, right. What is Damascene process? Okay, so if you look at this. Uh, uh, you can, this is what is called ITRS. Now, uh, in, uh, this is the industry technology roadmap for semiconductors, right? International technology roadmap for semiconductors. You can go to the website. I don't know how active this is because the scaling of, uh, aggressive scaling of 
devices have slowed down because of uh, the cost technology and also some fundamental limitations in the scalability of dielectrics and things like this. Okay. Uh, but you can uh, see here they talk about the pitch, for example, DRAM half pitch. Okay. DRAM half pitch. Um, so this is in nanometer. So you understand what is pitch, right? Yeah. So the if you have uh, uh, the smallest two lines that you can place close to each other, right? What would be the pitch of that? And then different. So you can see here mostly talking about memory devices, okay? Uh, and then uh, the contact in resist, for example, contact after edge, uh, the gate length, okay? Uh, and and so on and so forth. So you a very interesting thing. This was supposed to be using 193 nanometer lithography. Already in those days, the gate length, physical gate length target was 25 nanometers. How can you get 25 nanometers using a 193 nanometer lithography? Okay, very important uh, thing. Now, the one aspect that you should keep in mind is that these are, for example, if I take the gates, right? The gates are usually isolated structures. Meaning, of course, you have one transistor and then there is an isolation, the next one, okay? But if I go to a memory device, the situation changes. For example, if I have a flash memory, okay, uh, and NAND flash, okay? 32 N channel transistors are in series, connected in series. So the gates are placed very close by. In the CMOS inverter, there is an N channel MOSFET and a P channel MOSFET and isolation in between. Okay, so that no, that's not necessarily there in the case of a memory device. So the the, the specifications for pitches, you can uh, see the pitch is more uh, stringent in the case of the memory devices. Okay, here you talk more about the gate length, and again the metal pitch so that is uh, important because you once you make your transistors you connect them using metallization so what i would suggest you is to go through this okay but you also visit the itrs and it is actually a very good resource uh, i don't know what is the industry participation in this and so on but you can uh, see the uh, uh, this is a consortium of industry okay uh, semiconductor industry and they actually see what is the future technology of interest. Okay, So that's where uh, you know uh, scaling of transistors but also integration of sensors for IoT devices and so on and so forth became uh, you know were projected already 10 years ago or 15 years ago people started talking about integrating sensors onto the microprocessor platforms, not uh, really on a, uh, a PCB or a system level, but on the chip itself. Okay, so something that would be very useful for you to have a look. Okay, in uh, contact proximity printing, this is very simple. You have, uh, you know, a small gap maybe there, right? So you can uh, print it. The resolution is uh, not. Uh, so you can most of the time you get this, but you of course you you can uh, re you can't reduce this very very aggressively. So the uh, there will be some diffraction uh, effects if you go to much smaller dimensions than the uh, lambda, but this is usually not done, okay? Because this uh, kinds of uh, lithography systems are used for making larger features. Now, one very important thing is what is called a modulation uh, transfer function. So this is essentially you you have two lines, okay? Okay, 
So there are two lines and then you would have the intensities of light, meaning the light intensity corresponding to these two lines, uh, the mass would be or actually on the wafer would be two lobes like this, right? And this would be the other one. Okay, so the total intensity would be something like this. Okay, so this is then called the modulation trans function because of the proximity of these two lines, the intensity never goes to zero. Okay, so if I have many of them, right, then I would get yeah, this never goes to zero. Okay. So the, there is an intensity maximum and but also a minimum. So then there is a, what is it called then the contrast. Okay. Contrast reduces when you bring them together. So it is not possible for me to resolve the two lines. Okay. So the modulation trans function is defined by this equation. So the maximum intensity minus the minimum intensity divided by I max plus I min. Okay. So you can uh, see this uh, here, the minimum would go to 0, right, if the features are very large, yeah, this will go to 0, yeah, meaning the features are very far apart. So I would get this goes to 0, so the modulation trans function will be 1 and then if I am going to very small features, this keeps on increasing, right. Yeah, so I have it going closer to zero. Okay, so this will go up, and as a consequence, I max minus I min comes closer to zero. So the modulation trans function would actually uh, is plotted as a function of one um, inverse of the feature size. Okay, so this is something that I would uh, uh, need to worry about, and why this is important. Okay, so we'll see the other aspect. Now, I am talking about an image that is produced, but the image has to be transferred to photoresist and then to the wafer. Okay. Now, the photoresist would have certain characteristics. Okay. So this is the result of uh, an experiment where I take photoresist. Okay let us say 100 nanometer thick, okay. So the 100 is just arbitrary, okay. So 100 nanometer thick and then I expose this using light, okay, for a certain time, yeah. So the light intensity it can be written as some, you know, the energy, essentially I are worried about the energy, watt per meter square, okay. And then I expose it to for let us say 10 seconds. So the energy would be, energy density is then whatever would be the power per unit area multiplied by the time, okay. So that is called the dose, yeah. So here it is written as millijoules per centimeter square, okay. So I expose it for a certain time and then develop the photoresist, okay. And then I measure what is the thickness of the resist that is remaining after development. So you see that till this dose Q0 nothing happens to the photoresist. Okay. So it is supposed to create uh, you know uh, facilitate some photochemical reactions in the photoresist. Okay. Uh, so this is positive photoresist. So after exposure it is supposed to get dissolved in your developer. Okay. So you keep on increasing the dose at some point it's you can actually start to see etching of the photoresist okay and uh, this is always for this dose for example what is the remaining thickness of the uh, resist so we started with 100 nanometers so this would be 75 nanometer and so on and so forth and then at some dose no more photoresist would be remaining so this is the characteristics of the photoresist Okay. So this is called the response curve or contrast curve of the uh, photoresist and then the contrast is actually defined as uh, this function 1 by uh, log base 10 of 
qf qf is what this divided by q0 okay so contrast will be so now if i actually have this shrunk okay the ratio would be what happens to the ratio ratio is smaller okay so this would be a smaller number and i get high contrast high contrast so ideally i should have something going very sharp okay now for negative photoresist this is looks like this so as you spin coat you can completely dissolve it but then as you expose it to light it becomes harder okay and you can't remove it okay so just the opposite of what happens in the case of uh uh positive resist okay so you please uh, uh, be careful the qf is here okay this is qf and uh, in this case the qf is here okay the higher of the two doses that we are considering and these are real data so we had done some experiment on two types of uh, electron beam resist so it's electron beam so you can actually see the dose is not joules but rather it's measured in coulombs uh, micro coulombs okay so you are essentially you have a beam current right electron beam and then you integrate it over the time of exposure you get the charge deposited per centimeter square 